So the next talk we have is really a pleasure to have the opportunity to uh, offer to you. Uh, Catherine Schmitz is a professor who has been recently recruited to the Hillman Cancer Center from uh, Penn State, had previously been at Penn, and is really an international authority on the role of exercise in health and in treatment and in cancers. And basically, um, this relates very closely to Dr. Najar's, which we had accelerated because we were moving a little quicker than we had anticipated, but in fact is a perfect segue from the trial uh, results that Dr. Najar presented. And so welcome, Dr. Schmitz. Thank you so much for coming to talk about the role of exercise in the treatment of cancer and its prevention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, welcome. And um, I apologize. I thought that I was early, actually, and apparently somebody went a little fast with their talk. So, um, so I, I I gave my title a pre-title, and that is, but I'm so tired because generally when I talk to people living with and beyond cancer about exercise, one of the things I hear is, what is it you don't get about the fact that I'm so tired? Why would I exercise? And I'm hoping that I can show you some data that will convince you that it might be worth your while anyway. So as an overview, um, we're gonna move a little bit. Um, I'm gonna introduce you to something called exercise snacks. So if you're not an exerciser at all, um, this is sort of your um, gateway drug um, into maybe thinking about a little bit more movement. And then I'm gonna talk about why you should exercise. Part one, uh, exercise, cancer prevention, cancer treatment, and then we'll talk about part two, exercise to treat symptoms during and after treatment. We'll do another exercise snack. And then I plan to spend the second part of my time with you all, hopefully inspiring you um, and showing you some stories about other uh, patients who have uh, found their way to exercise as they've gone through their own cancer journey. Um, and hopefully it'll be helpful to you all as well. Okay, so our first exercise snack is a chair stand. If you are able to, to stand, great. If you are not, you're going to squeeze your butt cheeks, okay? So uh, I don't know, can I still be seen if I come over here? Do you think? Probably not? Okay, well then you're gonna have to use the picture. So everybody stand up, please. And you'll see what the picture is. You're basically sitting to your chair and coming back up 10 times. Here we go and down. And back up. And I am squatting back here, two. <laughs> you can't see me, but I am squatting. Three, and up. Four, and up. Five, you can keep my hand going. Six, <laughs> seven. The video of this is going to be hilarious, John. <laughs> Eight, nine. Last one is 10. Okay. Give yourselves a hand. Have a seat. So exercise snacks, the idea behind an exercise snack is that it's a short burst of exercise that you would do throughout the day. They're one minute workouts, fun filled, bite sized exercise events. The idea is if you're like, nope, not an exerciser, it's fine. Do five exercise snacks during the day. You've done five minutes of exercise. That's more than you would have done otherwise. Okay. So we'll do another one before I finish. All right. So. The epidemiologic evidence is compelling, extremely compelling, telling us that there are associations between physical activity and incident cancer, even after we adjust for body mass index for obesity. So what I'm showing on this slide is data from the largest pooled study that was done, combining data from 1.8 million individuals across North America and Europe, uh, led by Steve Moore from the National Cancer Institute, and what they were able to show, if you look at the vertical line, ooh, that's interesting. If you look at the vertical line uh, at where it says 1.0, that would be saying that there is no association between the uh, physical activity level and the cancer listed on the left. If on the other hand, you see that something is on the left of the line, which all of these are, you can see that all of these cancers, the incidence of all of these cancers is reduced as a result of being more physically active. Interestingly, what's not on the list pointedly, given what we're doing today? Melanoma. Melanoma is not on the list because in fact, the risk of melanoma is increased with physical activity. Can you guess why? Sun exposure. 
sun exposure. So people who are more physically active are more likely to be outside. They're more likely to get more sun exposure. It has nothing to do with the physical activity, okay? So uh, there's also evidence that exercise is associated with reduced risk of cancer specific mortality for three very common cancers, breast, colon, and prostate. And those percentage differences are huge. Those are very large effects of being more physically active and reducing risk of cancer specific mortality. There are a number of proposed mechanisms, and this is why uh, Dr. Kirkwood's comment about the timing of the two talks is absolutely perfect. Um, there are a number of proposed mechanisms that we would uh, uh, expect to be the reasons why exercise would have an effect on incident cancer. And they are the very same pathways that you just heard in the prior talk. The one that's not on this list, but I have data to show that exercise does affect the gut microbiome. And so it affects the gut microbiome, it affects immune response, T cells in particular, natural killer cells in particular, in particular, it affects metabolism, it affects tumor physiology, the tumor microenvironment is altered, the entire hormonal milieu around the tumor is altered as a result, all of the signaling cascades are changed as a result of exercise training, gene expression is changed as a result of exercise training, and that oxygen, that hypoxia that was talked about in the prior talk is altered dramatically as a result of doing exercise training. There was a beautiful review that was done on this topic by Perya Hoyman uh, in 2018. And what you can see on the top of this slide are three pairs of people, a man and a woman. And on the left side, they've got kind of a pudge um, and they're not very physically active. Um, and in these people, the expectation is that there is some small amount of metabolic disturbance and low-grade inflammation, which alters the tumor microenvironment as well as the systemic environment and the perfused environment uh, in a manner that alters cytotoxic immune function, metabolic health, uh, and perfusion to the tumor. If we do an acute exercise bout, we know that we activate natural killer cells and we know that we alter reactive oxygen species-induced cell damage. If we become regularly physically active, we are exercise trained, we have improved, excuse me, cytotoxic immune function and improved metabolic health. You just heard about the metabolism of the cell and that this metabolism of the cell is vitally important to our understanding of the response of melanoma cells to the treatments that are provided. One of the other things that is just wicked cool that came out of MD Anderson, actually it came out of my lab at Penn and then the postdoc moved to MD Anderson, um, is some beautiful animal work that shows that we alter perfusion of tumor cells. We alter the way that the blood vessels perfuse the tumor cells in a way that alters the likelihood of the cell getting the chemotherapy that we're trying to get to the, the tumor by doing regular physical activity. And I'll show you more data about that in just a moment. Um, I do wanna show you in that same review by Hoyman, um, there was a summary of uh, if you do voluntary wheel running uh, in, in uh, rodents, do you reduce tumor growth ac across a broad range of histologies, including melanoma? And one of the things that I find just fascinating is that the size of these effects, look at the size of these effects. Dr. Kirkwood just told you, we're doing a better job of getting the kinds of responses that we were getting 25% response, then we got 35% response. We can reduce tumor growth with exercise in a rat by 67% by doing a regular exercise program in that rat. So this is the data that I was uh, talking to you about that actually was uh, gathered at uh, the University of Pennsylvania when I was running a large U54 there. Uh, Carrie Shadler was the postdoc that led this work. Um, the graph on the left relates to melanoma cells and the graph on the right relates to uh, pancreatic cells. And I need to walk you through this and tell you, you know, what happened. So what they did was they had four groups of animals one group of animals did nothing. They did no exercise, they were given no chemotherapy, and that's the black circles. You can't even see them because they're buried in the, in the plot. 
Um, there was a group that was given just exercise, no chemotherapy, and that's the red squares. And you can see that's a bad idea. We don't want to replace chemotherapy with exercise um, because that's going to allow the tumor to go with unchecked growth. Okay. Um, what you can see is the black triangles are what happened to the growth of the tumor over 15 days um, with just doxorubicin, just, just the chemotherapy that was offered to the animals. But what you can most pointedly see is that the growth of the tumor is least in the animals that received an exercise intervention at the same time that they received the chemotherapy. And they were able to go back and take samples of the tissue from these animals and discerned that in fact, what was happening was that exercise was causing shear stress in the uh, blood vessels of these animals in a way that caused improved perfusion of the tumor so that the chemotherapy drug was better able to get to the tumor and treat the tumor. So I stand before you, perhaps the first person talking to you about the field of exercise oncology, but I am not alone. This is not a new field. This is a field that started in the 1940s at the Wistar Institute with some very surprised scientists who did some exercise in rats, thinking that they were stressing the animals and thinking that the rats were going to have increased number of tumors and increased tumor growth as a result of stressing the animals. Imagine being in that lab on the day that they realized that in fact their experiment had gone the exact opposite direction. So experiments have gone on like that since the 1940s. In the, in the 1980s, the first human clinical trials in exercise oncology were done at the Ohio State University by nursing scientists. And the field has slowly grown over the course of the 1990s and the 2000s. I wrote the first meta-analysis in this area in 2005. Uh, we had an ACSM roundtable, American College of Sports Medicine roundtable in 2010 to draw some conclusions and look at the data to say, what should we be recommending to people living with and beyond cancer? Uh, there was a 281% increase in the number of randomized controlled trials in this field between the first ACSM roundtable and the second one in 2018. And if you were to search what's called PubMed, um, and you can just Google for PubMed to look where the scientists look for their scientific publications, and you were to search on exercise, cross it with cancer, say human English clinical trials, you would get over 2,600 responses today. Now, maybe there are people who've published two papers on one trial, so let's say it's over 1,000 still. This is not something I invented this weekend in my garage. So what about the other cancer health related outcomes? It's not just the incidence of the cancer that we care about. We also care about symptoms, treatment tolerance and adverse effects of treatment. Well, great news, there are guidelines. So I am very proud to have been the person who has spearheaded the American College of Sports Medicine guideline process from 2010 as well as 2018. Um, but the American Cancer Society followed us in 2022. Um, and very importantly, uh, the American Society of Clinical Oncology released their guidelines in 2022 as well. There are two things to say here. One is, if you were to go back and look very carefully at the names listed in all of these publications, they barely overlap, but they all draw the same conclusion. That's really important. That tells you that this is a robust conclusion. The other thing that I think is awesome is that ASCO came forward with strong language. They said oncologists should, based on the data, should be referring their patients to exercise to deal with symptoms and side effects during their treatment. So what does exercise do for patients as they go through their cancer journey? We know that exercise is the number one treatment for cancer-related fatigue. So but I'm so tired, the number one treatment better than any pharmacologic agent available on the market for treating cancer-related fatigue is movement, is simply getting out of your chair and moving a little bit. Health-related quality of life is improved, physical function. So physical function, what the heck do I mean by physical function? I mean your ability to pick up a box and carry it across the room. I mean your ability to carry your grandchild. 
I mean, your ability to get on the floor because you forgot that you needed to get something underneath the couch. Uh, I, I mean, you know, wheeling your suitcase down uh, the, the hallway to be able to travel somewhere to see a, a loved one. I mean, your ability to carry your groceries, uh, your ability to make your bed, the ability to do the things that you need to do in order to function in your life and be independent. Anxiety and depression are made better by physical activity. Sleep is made better by physical activity. Breast cancer-related lymphedema is made better by uh, uh, physical activity. We don't have a whole lot of data about uh, uh, exercise and lymph uh, lymphedema in the setting of melanoma, but there is no reason to believe that the data would be different. And bone health is improved by physical activity as well. All right, exercise snack two. Everybody stand up. You wanna stand behind your chairs. And we're gonna do calf raises. What you can see here is she's lifting her heels. So we're gonna come up on our toes and back down. And two, and back down. And three, and back down. And four, and back down. And don't hold on, see what happens. <laughs> I've lost count, like every trainer, right? Seven. Is that seven? <laughs> Eight, nine, and 10. There you go. So you got a little balance exercise too. All right, well done. Okay, so for the remainder of my time with you, what I really wanna talk about is exercise oncology in action. I wanna give you some stories about people who have found their way to exercise during their cancer journey. And I start with the story of my friend, Bill Jolly, who goes by, by Jolly because he is. Um, and uh, he was invited to do a, a sprint triathlon back in 2011 by a friend. And he was just completely exhausted doing all of the exercise. And the quote he had was, I know I'm out of shape, but I sh should I be this tired? Developed something like chest congestion, had no, nothing showed up on a chest scan. He was prescribed albuterol for what they thought was adult onset asthma. Um, a month later, uh, a mile into a run, uh, his friend says to him, damn Jolly, I didn't know you had asthma. And he said he was wheezing so bad it sounded like he swallowed a whistle. So PCP ordered a second chest scan and uh, said, it looks like you have an enlarged heart, probably nothing just an athlete's heart. I'll have my friend who's a radiologist take a look for you. Um, the radiologist recommends a CT, which confirms stage three lymphoma and a biopsy uh, two months later revealed small lymphocytic lymphoma. In January of 2012, he started six rounds of chemotherapy. He, in the same month, started training with the Leukemia Lymphoma Society team in training. Five months after chemo, he completed a marathon. Um, the next year, he did an Olympic try. The next year, he did an Olympic try. In 2018, he did a half marathon. In 2016, he relapsed. He had a remission, uh, four years of remission. Um, uh, he felt an enlarged node under his armpit during a shower, and he started oral chemotherapy or immunotherapy. Um, in January of 2017, this is, this is crucial. This is why I title my talk what I do, Increasing Fatigue, Growing Significant. The quote I felt myself going to a dark place and I didn't like it. I didn't want to work. I didn't want to talk to my wife or kids. And after four days of increasing depression, I told my wife at 1030 at night that I had to go for a run. One mile into the run, my fatigue and depression just vanished. I discovered I could keep the fatigue and depression away as long as I exercised every other day. And in October of that year, he finished his first Ironman. He continues to do Ironman competitions. Jolly allows me to share his story if I share this slide in particular. Jolly's takeaways are that you need to listen to your body, that your body will tell you that something's wrong before the lab tests will tell you that something is wrong. If something feels off, don't ignore it. Be quick to get help from allied health professionals such as exercise, nutrition, and psychology. Medicine and surgery are not the only tools for a cancer journey. Exercise can reduce or eliminate medication symptoms and reduce reoccurrence of some cancers. And very importantly, very importantly, cancer often feels like something that happens to you. I am a cancer caregiver. My wife went through head and neck cancer. I know the cancer can feel like something that happens to you. So this is a way for you to feel that you have a mental victory and you get something back. 
The list goes on. Sydney Hooper is a pancreatic cancer survivor, Ironman competitor. Susan Helmrich is a three-time survivor. Some of us might be old enough to remember the DES trials and the DES daughters. Uh, she also had lung cancer and pancreatic cancer. She's a master swimmer. Gabriella Grunwald was a patient with adenoid cystic carcinoma who was diagnosed in 2011. While she was an advanced cancer patient, she was a sponsored rank USA track and field runner. She placed just one shy of getting into the Olympics in London while she had cancer. She was the national champion of the 3000 meter while she had cancer. Gabe had a, she has a foundation called Brave Like Gabe. She had a, a, a quote that she went to a lot. There are two ways to live your life. The first is as if nothing is a miracle. And the other is as if everything is a miracle. Mike Levine uh, pictured on the left as a young man doing Ironman competitions. He was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer and told basically, you know, we're, we're done. There's not a whole lot left we can do for you. Um, and, uh, you know, he stopped doing any kind of exercise and his friends showed up and said, you yeah, let's go for a, a mile long run. Let's go for a, you know, a walk. Let's get on the bike and just tool around the neighborhood. And what he was shocked by was with stage four pancreatic cancer, that he had something left in the tank and that he was able to go back and do one more competition. Keegan Randall's story is really dramatic as well. Keegan Randall is a US Olympian. She's a gold medalist from Pyeongchang. She was a phenom in Pyeongchang as it was because first she got a gold medal for cross country skiing against some Scandinavians. Americans never win against the Scandinavians. Um, also because she was a young mother at the time and that's pretty unusual for uh, Olympians at that, or athletes at that level. But when she came home three months after coming home from Pyeongchang, she was diagnosed with an aggressive breast cancer. And she went right into athlete frame of mind. She's made a public commitment to stay active. She rode her bike to and from the treatments. You can go online and, and Google Keegan Randall and see pictures of her doing her exercise while she's going through her treatment, completely bald. Um, and uh, she definitely had bad days. And on those days, she would try to do something for at least 10 minutes. So it's not like everybody's doing a marathon every day. Um, very important quote here, moving helped me feel better physically. And more importantly, it gave me a mental victory. She credited feeling uh, physical activity for helping her body process all of the treatments. So her goal now is to raise awareness for this. She and I have partnered on this. A number of times. I was president of the American College of Sports Medicine the year that she came and I got to share the stage with her. That was very special. So what I would conclude with is that I think it's time for a paradigm shift. We have this easy, low-tech approach to try to improve the health of people living with and beyond cancer. It's available right now. And we did a little bit of it today. Exercise is indeed medicine for people living with and beyond cancer. You don't need to do a, a triathlon. You don't need to do a marathon. You don't need to be an Ironman. Taking a 10 minute walk is actually going to make a difference and will make differences physiologically in the very same pathways that are described in the more basic science talks today. Um, I am delighted to tell you that we have started the Moving Through Cancer program at Hillman Cancer Institute, Cancer Center. And uh, if you are interested in more information about this, I hope you'll find me during the break or uh, go check out this website, or even Google Hillman and Moving Through Cancer, and you'll find it very quickly. Okay, thank you. So I didn't want Catherine to leave the podium because that was such a wonderful talk, and thank you. What you heard about from several of the talkers, <laughs> talkers, the speakers before Catherine, is that the leading cause of dose interruption, the leading toxicity of targeted therapy, not even the immunotherapy, but of also our immunotherapy, the leading toxicity is fatigue. So you just heard about something that we should have been implementing a long time ago. Several of you in the audience, I won't point to you and name you, but uh, you are avid cyclists. 
And basically, you know how important exercise is. It's critical, uh, really, to everything uh, that is the rest of us. And this fits so perfectly following Yana's talk about tumor cell and T-cell metabolism. It's your whole body's metabolism that's important.